أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المقضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا رب العالمين Today we're going to be talking about several scattered topics as we are in the process of learning Surah Al-Fatiha. And as I said earlier on that this is the opening Surah of the Holy Quran. That's why the word Al-Fatiha means the opening. And this surah summarizes the entire Qur'an. And the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the summary of entire Surah Al-Fatiha. That is why you see that there is such a big depth in it. So we we're going to be talking about in terms of Surah Al-Fatiha as to since we recited in every salah, how can we use this surah to build the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and strengthen that relationship? Because Surah Al-Fatiha is a surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forth his characteristics and then brings forth the characteristics of his servants so that there can be a connection between the two pieces. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself Allah in the very first ayah. Alhamdulillah. And then calls himself Rabb, Rabb al-Alameen. So he uses two different names in the first statement. Second statement uses two more words, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And then the third one says Malik. There, this makes it basically his names, Allah, Rahman, Rahim, Malik, and Rabb. Five names. Allah is the name that he has chosen for himself. Rabb means the caretaker. Rahman means the unconditional giver. Who will give to anybody and everybody who believes in him and doesn't believe in him, gives him all wealth and health and necessities of life in this world to sustain. And Rahim is the property that he will going to apply on the Day of Judgment to those who really believed in him and lived by the principles he laid for them. So those are the people that shall enjoy the life hereafter. Now, the word Malik means that he is the ruler of the Day of the Judgment because he is the one who needs to decide. Now, these are his properties. So when he says, I am Allah, what is our duty according to Surah Al-Fatiha to live up to that word Allah? He made sure that in every salah we say, Iyaka na'budu. You are Allah, so we worship you and you alone. That is why there is إِيَّاكَ The يَا has a shadda on it. Whenever in Arabic language you notice there is a word or a letter on which there is a shadda, means a double sound, that means there is a double emphasis on that word. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called upon Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha, he said, O oh Moses, إِنَّنِي أَنَ Allah. He doesn't say, أَنَ Allah. I am the Allah. He doesn't say that alone. He says, Innani anallah. Indeed, Moses, the Lord that you have heard all your life, I am that Lord Allah. So the shatta has a special meaning. Similarly, in Arabic language, you will notice the, the places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the prolonged sound. Like sama for skies, because of father. But when you talk about the word jibal for mountains, it is only two second prolongation because the height of the mountain is compared to, to the sky is much smaller. But when you talk about earth, ard, no matter. So this is the beauty of the language that is very expressive. So what is the idea of the tajweed? To make the Quran expressive. And that is why the people who really truly understand it, when they recite, they add expressions and emotions when they recite. So when they're talking about conversation, they actually read it in a conversation fashion. When they're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings, they are enjoying those blessings while they're reading. So if they cry, they're crying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me these benefits. If they look at the punishments, 
they are fearful because now they're seeing those punishments. So that's what Quran does to an individual, extremely moves it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya iyaka na'budu. It is only I that you will going to worship. And then when we call him Rabb, that means the caretaker. So in response to that, we say, Iyaka nasta'in. Since you are my caretaker, only you that I ask help from. Only you are my sustainer. You are only my, you are the only one who can take care of me. Iyaka nasta'in. And when we say you are Ar-Rahman, that means the one that gives and gives unconditionally. So the one who gives, please guide me. Because you give unconditionally. So give me guidance. Ihdina. Just the word. Ihdina. Guide me. When you talk about Rahim, the merciful on the day of judgment, that is Sirat al-Mustaqim. On the right path. If I'm not on the right path, I'm just guided, not on the right path. What happens to me? I'm not successful in the day I will meet you. Because I know I got to meet you because you are the Maliki Yawmiddin. You are the one who is the ruler and the master of the day of judgment. So on that day when I meet you, I want to be among you chosen people. Surat al ladina an'amta alayhim. So Make me among your selected people in this life. And do not make me among those people that you have been angry with. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Nor the people who are misguided. So notice, you started with إِهْدِنَا The guided. And you end with وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Do not make me among the misguided. Okay. So it balances the equation there. So those are the five qualities and those are the things that we are saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we believe in it and we want to live by your words. So now, what happens when you do this? There is an evidence in another surah, Surah Al-Kahf, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you finish yourself in me, you kill your will. It is only me that exists. That what happens? Then I start calling you my servant. And when I start calling you my true servant, my true servant, what happens after that? Then I start giving you knowledge that cannot be attained through any human being. Then I open doors of mercy and blessings for you that you will going to be amazed by. And when Musa alayhi salam was asked to go meet a person, and his guide was a dead fish who came to life. And he made a way for Moses to go and meet that person. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduce that person in the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَوَجَدَ And he found Abd, my servant. My servant. And the qualities of the servant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abdam min ibadina. He was one of the servants from my servants. Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. Oh Allah, make me among those people that you will call your abd. That you will call, this is my servant. So he was one of the servants from my servants. So what did I, what did I give me? Give him? Ataynahu rahma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I delivered to him. Personally, my blessing, Rahma. Wa indana min indina from me. Wa alamna and I taught him milla dunya ilma. I gave him a special knowledge from me to him that was not with Moses, was only with Khidr. And Moses, Moses learned that knowledge from Khidr. And what Moses had, Khidr did not have it. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Come to me and I will open the doors for you. Try. That's why in one of the hadiths, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you make a step towards me, I come many folds to you. You come walking to me, I come running to you. But come to me. That's the bottom line. Come to me. So as the imam today also said in the khutbah, and we also know it from our past life, that salah is the mi'raj, of mu'min. What does that mean? That means it elevates a person who is a believer. Elevates. That's why when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to the heavens on a nightly journey, which is also called mi'raj. Because his view is elevated. 
So the elevation is Mi'raj. His night journey on the earth is called Isra. Isra is the night journey, Mi'raj is the elevation. So how does the Salah elevate an individual? Now there are five steps that we need to keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the five names I talked about. One is that He created us. He is the Creator, Allah. And then when He sent us over here, what is the responsibility on Him to make sure that He prepares us for the life hereafter? And I'm going to bring again the hadith we, we heard in today's Jum'ah Khutbah. Imam said, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that I have come to complete your good manners. So it is on him to prepare us that how he wants us to be. <coughs> that is the aspect of Rabb. That he is the caretaker of our inside out. Then the other thing is that he needs to sustain us. So that's his Rahman. He is so merciful that he, we can get sustained. And then he is Rahim, so that when we reach that idea of a completeness to however we can in our capacity, he will going to give us what he promised. So that is his Malik property. That means on the day of judgment, he is the caretaker of those who really took care of what he has given down to us. Now notice, we came here from a different world. When we move on, we go to a different world. So he had been transferring us from a place to a place. Then when we are rise again from dead, we now present to him in a different world. And then he sent people in the east or the west or the one world or the other means hell or heaven. So in all these places, what has he been doing? Transferring us. And when he transfers us, he makes sure we get transferred in a complete sense. It's not like a person is rising up and is incomplete. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been a caretaker in all these respects. Now, that leads us to one of the hadiths which is called the Hadith of Jibra'il. When in the later life of the Prophet Muhammad in the Medina, a man walked in, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala who reports it, it's also reported by several other companions, a man walked in. He was a stranger to us. We never saw him before. But by looking at him, it didn't seem like he traveled much. He came and sat in front of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam so that his knees were touching the Prophet's knees and he put his hand on the Prophet's knees and he bent forward. He would ask Prophet a question and Prophet respond to that question. And instead of saying, yeah, I got it, he would say, yes, you're telling the truth. As if he already knew the answers. He just came to confirm them. And when he was gone, the Prophet said to his companion, do you know who came? And they said, we have no idea. And he said, this was Jibra'il, who came to teach you your own religion. So this question and answer that was going on was for you. He also knew the questions and answers and I also knew the questions and answers. It was just for you. So one of the questions he asked, what is Ahsan? What is it? Now before I answer that question, a belief system has three stages. When you enter it, you are a Muslim. When you progress and you are at an affirmation of faith, you become a mu'min. But when you achieve the highest point from where improvement keeps going on, but it's a great point of sustenance, it is called muhsin. So there are three stages. Muslim, mu'min, muhsin. And he asked all three questions. What is Islam? That means what defines a Muslim? What is Iman? What defines a mu'min? And what is Ihsan? What defines a muhsin? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Ihsanu an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. Ihsan is that you worship your Lord as you are seeing Him. That is one state and the better state. 
فَإِلَّمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ If you can see him, فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكْ He sees you all the time. That is not the best of the two states. But both states qualify as the state of Ahsan. What does that mean? That means whenever we pray, we must be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentally, physically, and spiritually. That is why among the Sufiya, they used to train people how to bring the spirituality in the Salah. So a lot of the people who would graduate out of the school system with a degree of mufti or a degree of alim, scholar, muhaddith, mufassir, they would go and spend time with these people because they will train them how to apply your knowledge. Then when you say, Allahu Akbar, your heart should also say, Allahu Akbar. Inside out, you must say, I consider him the greatest. When you fold your hands in front of him, you literally fold yourself inside out. You don't exist anymore. It is only He who exists. And you do not exist. You do not even consider yourself as you exist. This is the state which is called that you are seeing your Lord. But if somewhere in you, you are in a state where you have not reached a point that you don't exist, then remember in the core in each and every step of Salah that He exists and is seeing every action that you're doing. And remember, His eyes are on your intention. Not on your physical appearances alone. Because that's for the people around you. They may only see you from outside, but He sees you from inside and outside. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us through the words of this Prophet, that I want you to reach the state of Ahsan. But you got to start from somewhere to get to the state of Ahsan. Now here I would like to bring another point in front of you, that a lot of you have read the translation of Surah Al-Fatiha in whatever language you would have read it. But I'm not sure if you've ever paid emphasis to the translations and the pronouns. Look at it again. <clears throat> In the name of the God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. All praises to the God who is the God of the worlds, who is the most merciful, the most beneficent, the one who is the master of the day of the judgment. Okay? Notice it so far, there the pronoun is in third form. We call it Al Ghaib. Even though the word he is not there, but the he is there. He is the most merciful. He is the most beneficent. He is the master of the day of judgment. It's in third form. Now all of a sudden, from the next statement, it switches from a third form to a second form. It is he who we ask help from. It is he who we worship. <coughs> And then it switches to first form. Oh Allah, guide me or guide us. So why there is a change of form? And this is where the answer lies. First, He wants you to finish yourself. When you finish yourself, the third form does not exist anymore. Not only He exists or you exist. There is nobody else, no thoughts, nothing. So either you are in the state that he sees you, or you are in the state that you see him. That is why Surah Al-Fatiha all of a sudden changes the context. So in Arabic language we call it moving from Dhamir Al-Ghaib to Dhamir Al-Mukhatib, means in conversation. Now Dhamir Al-Mutakallim is the first form. So it's, you, it's a big switch from of one form to the other, while the surah stays the same, the rukur stays the same, the context stays the same, automatically things switch around. It's one of the beauties that we need to pay a little bit emphasis on. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this surah will elevate you, 
will going to bring that servant out of you that I want to make out of you if you really pay attention. So now we're going to move on to our next topic. Because I said we're going to be looking at several scattered topics. So the Fatha has five foundation codes. Five foundation codes. Starting from the fourth ayah. Iyaka na'bud. That's a code of ibadat. That we worship you and worship alone. Now the form of worship that is most probably used is salah. Generally speaking, if we look at the unique steps in salah, the very first unique step is Allahu Akbar. It's one unique step. Which is called takbir, tahrima, takbir al-ula. The first time we say it, Allahu Akbar. That's one step, then done. Another step in the salah which is unique is the qiyam, when you're standing. Another unique step is when you are in the ruku'ah. Another unique step, step is when you come back from the ruku'ah. I've noticed some people come back from the ruku'ah and they fold their hands again. No, you should not fold it back again. Let it go. Okay? So this is a unique step. This is not like the step before ruku'ah where you fold your hands. This is you let go. Then the next unique step is you actually do the sajda, the prostration. Another unique step is that you literally sit. It's either between the two sajdas or it is after the second sajda. But now sajda is the only thing that happened twice. All other steps only happen once. So this is where ulama have linked the steps in the salah with Surah Al-Fatiha. And what those steps actually mean. So when you say Allahu Akbar, you hold your hands up. That means I lift my hands from all the things this world possess. And I come in the presence of my Lord. Allahu Akbar. Humbly I come to Him. This is the step where you praise Him. You say the thana. And this is exactly the opening of Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praises to the Lord. Because that's the first thing that comes out of your mouth after you fold your hands. Thana, His praise. Then you go in Qiyam. You're standing at peace and harmony. And this is basically where you get the peace from Surah Al-Fatiha. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Both are stages of peace. Then you go into ruku'ah, you bend down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is not bending all the way down. This is a bending of accepting Him as to be your Lord. Maliki yawmiddin. That I've come to you, I'm coming to you, and I accept you. Then you take the next step. You go back up. You back, go back up. And now what you're doing you are getting ready to give yourself in front of him by going in prostration. This is where you claim, It is only you that I worship. Now I'm coming down to you. You perform your first sijda and you give in yourself. It is you only that I ask help from. I give away myself. Then you come back up. And then you go again. Since I've given myself up, I seek help from you alone. The next time you go, you're basically asking from him the guidance. Ehdina. Guide us on the right path. Now that you have asked everything from him that you needed to ask to be successful in this life and hereafter, when you come back up in the last rakah in your sitting position, this is the position in which generally a person sits when he is awaiting. So what are you awaiting for? You're awaiting for those blessings. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Done. Sirat al-ladheena an'amta alayhim ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim wa al-dhalleen. My Lord, I've given away everything I had for you and I accept you all in all. So please accept my plea and make me among those who are righteous and guided. And do not make me among those that you have not been happy with. So, th- <clears throat> so that's another relationship ulama has made between the steps of the salah 
and the steps of Surah Al-Fatiha. Then in Surah Al-Fatiha, there is a code of asking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Now here comes another question in the mind. Should I not be seeking the help first from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then worshipping Him? Because I cannot worship Him without seeking His help. But here we notice there is a switch. There's a switch. I worship you and then I ask help from you. It should be I ask help from you so please help me worship you. So there way, that's what ulama explains. That there are two rights that have been talked about in this ayah. One is the right of Lord on you and one is the right of you on your Lord. What is Allah's right on me? In Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. كَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا This is mandatory for me. This is your right on me. What is your right on me? نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That I will going to make sure that the mu'mineen are the one who are successful. This is your right on me. I'll take care of that. What do you got to do? إِيَّاكَ نَعْدُ you got to worship me and me alone. And then I will going to make things so easy for you in the life hereafter and here as well. But the real success is there. But you still got to do your job here. You've been sent here not to just pray, but also do worldly affairs because that's the test. See, this is where we get differentiated from angels. Angels just worship. They have no test. That's why they're not to worry about going to heavens. But at the same time, they envy us because we are at a place that they're not. They were made bow down to Adam because Adam was superior to them because Adam had a choice and yet he had to make a right decision to be successful. They don't have a choice. They will always make the right decision because they don't have a choice. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have a choice. Now you make the right decision and come to me and I'll take care of you. Now there is this famous companion. It's not a companion, it's the Tabi'in. Uwais Al-Qarni. Probably might have heard of his name too. He could have been a companion. And he wrote to the Prophet, he was in Yemen, that I want to come and meet you and see you. But I have one obligation, my old mom. I can't leave her. So the Prophet said, it is better for you to take care of your mom in the old age than come and meet me and be my companion. Subhanallah. He let that place to go away, slide away, the companionhood, because it was the order of the Prophet to take care of your parents. That's more than becoming my companion. So he got to see the companions of the companion. He, he got to see the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So this person was a shepherd. Shepherd. And Imam Bahati and several of the people have reported it in their books. He's a shepherd and he's a big scholar. He's a very pious person. A man comes to visit him. He had a question. But he's baffled. When he comes to him and he's a shepherd in the middle of the day and then when he is praying so he doesn't disturb Uwais al-Qarni. When Uwais al-Qarni is done with his prayer he said, I'm amazed. I even forgot my question. How is it possible that a wolf is taking care of the sheep when it's supposed to eat it? And a way says that the servant of God when reaches that state, then God takes care of his matters. But this is a state which takes a lot of hard work. And I'll give you an example. You probably might have heard of this. When Awais al-Qarni came to know that Prophet lost his tooth in the battle of Uhud, he did not know which two tooth he lost. So he took a stone and broke all his tooth. To a common man, it was not a rational decision. But love is never rational. Love is never rational. That is why there is a famous person in the Arab history 
Majnun away uh, is Qais. Uh, uh, Majnun is probably known by in other places. He was in the middle of the desert and crying out loud to Layla, his lover. And a bunch of the mullahs go past him. And it's a Zuhr time, so they start praying and stuff like that. When they get done with their prayer, they approach Qais and like, what kind of a person you are? We have been praying here, and you have been crying out loud, Layla, Layla, Layla. We got disturbed in the prayers. And he looked at them and said, Really? I was remembering Layla and I did not even knew that you existed. You were remembering your Lord and you heard my voice? This is basically the kind of love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. That when you are in my presence, you are in my presence. We can work hard on it. It's, it's not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for working hard. But if a person gives, a, gives away, that's a different deal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says, when you need help, إِسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ salah Patience. And prayers. What exactly is patience? Patience is not like, brother, I am patient. But oh my God, you do not believe what happened to me. Now that's not patience. That's not patience. Patience is that you accept it and you are happy and content still. That's patience. And salah means that you are thankful to your God whatever He has given you. Whatever. Because you could have been in a worse state. You could have been in a worse state. He kept you in a state. You are unaware who else is in the worst state. So be thankful. Ista'inu bi sabr. Be happy and be thankful. Those are the two states Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to achieve. Now Ibrahim Naqai, a great saint of his times, he was visited by another bunch of young men from another city. And he asked them a question. Do you have Waliullah, the friends of Allah in your city? He said, yeah, they are. He said, okay, now, how is their state? He said, we'll tell you their state later on. First, tell you what is the Waliullah state in your city. He said, the state of Waliullah in my city is that when we don't get anything, when we don't get anything, we are patient. When we get something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are thankful. So those bunch of young men started laughing. And Ibrahim Nafi says, I never felt this much ashamed in my life. I was a sheikh. I was, a, I was an old man. These were a bunch of young people who were laughing on my face on my response. I told him, why are you laughing? He said, well, whatever you just said cannot be an act of waliullah because even animals do that. He said, okay, then tell me, what is the state of Waliullah in your city? He said, the state of the Waliullah in our city is, when they don't get it, they're thankful. When they don't get it, they're thankful that now I don't have to answer my Lord for this blessing. And when they get it, they distribute it. They share it. They don't consume it just by themselves. So this is the state where a Muslim has to try to achieve, this is where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi said, "I have come to put you on the highest state of the moral values a human can achieve." Because Allah subhanahu wa taala in the Quran says, "O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in Naka, once again it's a shadda, in Naka, indeed you are la ala khuluqin azim at the highest value a human can achieve or any being can achieve." So he himself was a practicing person, so that's why he preached what he practiced. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ista'inu bis sabri wa salah. And in another surah, Surah Al Amnashra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma'al usri yusra. Yes, indeed, after every hard time, there comes an easy time. But the problem is, we forget it when the easy time comes. We forget our Lord. But when the hard time comes, then we remember Him. And that's why we don't know when those easy time comes, when those good time comes. You know, especially for a lot of us, it's between February and April when we get our tax returns, right? 
<laughs> Good times, right? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, the third thing is, Surah Fatiha talks about the code when you ask for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are two kinds of guidance. One is a rational guidance, like what a man thinks. And this rational guidance itself is actually of four types. One is called the natural guidance. That's what's instilled in you. This is right, this is wrong. I must do this, I must not do that. But that's still instilled in you, but still you make a decision on it. Sometimes it happens is if your surrounding is not the greatest, you ha- you're doubtful of good and bad. You really are doubtful of good and bad. The second form is sensory. Sensory, what you perceive by your senses. This is harmful, this is not harmful. This is good, this is bad. The third form is rational, what you think. What you think as an individual in your head. The fourth form is called the intuitively, which is the one where you are still relying on your own soul. But from the mind, it has reached the status of soul. But if the soul is corrupt, we're not going to find peace in the goodness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Najm, إِنَّ الظَّنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا Your assumptions, your assumptions, what you think is good and what you think is bad, can never replace the truth. What really is good, what really is bad, your assumptions will not take place of that. It is your personal opinion. Your personal opinion does not carry any weight in front of my opinion and my word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where should we go to take your word and your values? Well, come to my Prophet. Well, we haven't seen their times. We are after them. Then, صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Those that I have guided. They will be your source of knowledge. Not you. Because you can make mistakes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-An'am says, أَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا My path, my path is the right path. فَاتَّبِعُوهُ Follow it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we follow it? Where should we get guidance? Okay, I'll take you to Surah Al-Shura. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّكَ Again, Shadda Indeed لَتَّهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمِ Indeed, you are the one who guide people to the right path. You are the one. So they should come to you. And صِرَاطِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ And the route of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the true route by and, and the reason that route exists, because everything in the universe has invested themselves in that route. In another place in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> this is to show you the place of the Prophet, follow him. Why? So that you are guided. He's guided. <coughs> He's not worried about himself. He's already guided. But you need to be guided. Sirat al So there are four categories of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says were guided lies. Al Anbiya, the Prophets, Siddiqeen, the truthful, Al Shuhada, the people who are the extroverts, who just go out and they're truthful. The people by looking at them, you can see the difference between right and wrong. So shuhada doesn't really necessarily mean a person who fell on the battleground. That's one form of it. But shaheed by definition is the one who is a witness on his faith. He's a lawyer of his faith. And some ulama have actually given this comparison that the siddiqeen, the best of them was Abu Bakr. And shuhada, the best of them was Umar. Because he couldn't, he would never give up or would never consolidate when it comes to the matter of right and wrong. He will say, this is right and this is wrong. I'm not giving in. This kind of personality he had. 
And then the fourth is salihin, the people who are righteous within themselves. They may not be an advocate or a lawyer, they may not have been in that capacity because of their personality, but they're the righteous people. Their presence around you and you sitting among them, with them, will help you improve yourself because their thought process is right. In the fourth code, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the fourth code the Fatiha gives you is steadfast. You got to be steadfast in what you believe in. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran says in Surah Bani Israel, Inna hadha al-Quran, this book again, Shadda, Inna, indeed this book, Yahdi lillatihi aqwam. It shows you the path which is the right path, the most right, aqwam, the most right path. This is the book that shows you that. And I'll now like to back this up with some hadith. The first one is reported by Imam Ahmad, Musnad Ahmad. He says, Allah subhanahu, the Prophet reports, that whenever the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves another servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah's sake, okay, loves another servant of Allah for Allah's sake, what does Allah do to that person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the gates of righteousness for that person. Because he loved somebody in love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, in Ibn Majah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خِيَارُكُمْ The real saints among you are those, الَّذِينَ إِذَا رَأَوْا When you look at them, ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ You got reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the real people. That they are the moving picture of Islam. Each and every act that they perform is according to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in accordance with Quran and sunnah. That reminds me of another short story. I'm giving these stories because these are practical examples from life. So there was this big saint in India and then a person went in his presence, lived there for a few months and then one day said, Sheikh, I want to leave. I heard a lot about you. I want to leave now. He said, okay. That's fine, you can go. But why are you leaving? He said, I lived for all these months with you. I never saw a miracle. I came all this way thinking you're such a big sheikh. I I was hoping some miracle would happen. He said, okay, I'll ask you one simple question. All these months that you lived with me, have you noticed any action that I have performed that was not in accordance with Quran and Sunnah? He said, no. I've never seen a single action from you that would go against Quran and Sunnah. He said, that is the only miracle I have to offer. So this is basically the salihin. Their life is an example of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us. So by looking at them, it reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, subhanAllah. Subhanallah. So, a beautiful hadith reported by Imam Muslim in Sahih al-Muslim. And this is for all those people who truly, really love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now before I give this hadith to you, think about if the entire community is gathered here. Entire community is gathered here. Entire Kenosha is gathered here. And somebody in the capacity of the mayor of the Kenosha comes here and calls you by name and says, So and so, can you please stand up and come forward? And when you come forward, in front of the entire community starts praising you. Now this is the guy I'm talking about. He is the guy that I have been talking about. This is the good example of this community. How will you feel like? 100,000 people, that's all. That's, that's, That's the total population of this city. That's it. Okay? Now think about it on the day of judgment. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you and singles you out. And blesses you in front of entire humanity and jinns and angels and say, This is what I was talking about. How are you going to feel? Now I'm going to present to you that hadith. That's why I wanted to give you the context first. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, not to an angels, Inna Allah yaqul. This is hadith al-Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is saying, 
Prophet is reporting that this is what Allah said. Yawm al Qiyamah, on the day of the judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call about, Ayn al Mutahabbuna bi Jalali. Where are those lovers who loved for me? Where are they? Bring them all. SubhanAllah. And they will all gather in front of everybody in a special spot. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will going to make the next announcement. Al-yawm adhilluhum fi zilli. Today, I will going to put them under my shade. Yawm la zilla illa zilli. Because today is the day that there is no shade but my shade. They will be among those seven group of people that will be under the shade on the day of judgment. Just by doing what? Loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't say love Muslims only. Love for Him. Because remember, He's Rahman. He gives unconditionally, irrespective of you believe in Him or not believe in Him. He will going to provide you with the blessings. But on the day of judgment, if you never believed in Him, then there is never over there for you. So that is the quality that He wants us. When you're here, you should take from that quality. It doesn't matter who is in crisis. Don't look at their faith. Don't look at their race. Don't look at their color, creed. Help them. Help them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorizes in Quran that these are the categories I want you to take care of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with parents, relatives, orphans. Doesn't say Muslim orphans, orphans. The needies. The neighbor who is near to you and also the neighbor who is far from you. Any kind of neighbor. Any kind. The traveler. The person who is traveling, he's away from home. Your companions, the people that you are in your companionship in any capacity. Right now, you're all companions. At job, you have companions. Different places you go, you have companions. And the people that you have been made supervisor over. People who are under your command and possession. Be good to all these categories. Now that pretty much holds all the categories of people that we deal with on a daily basis. Now think about it, there are people who are so arrogant. I'm not talking about one particular race or religion who go out in the restaurants and they sit on the table and look at them the way they call the waiter. As if he's their slave. Hey waiter, come here! He's a human being. You have to respect every individual. And if a Muslim does it, it's even worse. Because he was told to take care of the people that are in your companionship. He's your companion now. Because he's in the same setting as you are. It's not your slave. Even to slaves, you should not talk like that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid these foundations for us right in this surah. And the last code that I want to talk about here before we call it tonight is the code where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is a code where you ask for me the blessings. Now Imam Razi who wrote the seal of Kabir in rewrote that there are eight doors of heaven and all eight of them open through Surah Al-Fatiha and the Salah. How? The first door is called Babul Ma'rifa. The door through which those people would enter who really truly knew their Lord, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They knew Him. And when you know Him, you only worship Him. There is another door called Babul Dhikr. Those who were enchanting Him was in Dhikr. In all forms, physical, mental, spiritual. Babul Shukr. The bab, the door through which those will enter who are thankful. Babu Rija, those people will enter who never lost hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Babu Khawf, those who were fearful. Babu Ikhlas, people who had good intentions. Babu Dua, those who basically said dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they believed He is my nasta'een. 
and babun iqtida, those who followed the righteous people. And if you notice, all of these pe- things are there in, in the salah or right within the Surah Al Fatiha. Now, when you open your salah, how do you open it after you fold your hand? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarakasmuka wa ta'ala jattuka wa la ilaha ghayruk. What exactly does it mean? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Oh Allah, how perfect you are. How perfect you are. All praises to be to you and alone, you alone. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Wa tabarakasmuk. Blessed is your name. Wa ta'ala jadduk. And you are exalted. You are my majesty. Why do you say these words? This is where you are mentally giving in. You are all in all. And then how do you end? Wa la ilaha ghayruk. There is nobody that can be worshipped but you. You establish your grounds for tawheed. That now I know my Lord who is Babul Ma'rif The door of the Ma'rif. Then you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The Babul Thikr opens up. Then you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Babul Shukr opens up. Then you say Ar Rahman Rahim, the one who gives everything. And will give those who believed in him everything on the day of judgment. So that opens a door of hope. Baba Raja, that you believe in him. And then you say, Maliki Yawmiddin. That means you're fearful of the day when you will be accountable. So you don't do anything that you will basically be in a bad shape in front of him. That opens a Babu Khawf. Then when you say, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. To only you I worship. To only you I seek help from. The babu the khlas open up. Because now you have your purest intention for him and him alone. And when you say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Oh Allah, guide me. What are you doing? Now the door of dua opens up. And when you say, Sirat al-ladheena an'amta alayhim. Please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me find those people that who are righteous. So what you are trying to do, you are now opening the babu iqtida that you are following the righteous people. And we'll close out with an ayah of Surah Al-Fajr. The closing ayahs of Surah Al-Fajr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna All the state of the nafs that has reached the highest point that could be reached by a servant of God is called the nafs of mutma'inna, peaceful. It is in agreement with everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to him and Allah is also agreeing with this individual. So it is radiyallahu anhum wa radma'an. Both states have been achieved here. Ya ayyatuha nafs al Ilji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya. Come to your Lord you're happy with him and he's happy with you. Come. But there is one clause that you should go through. And what is that, Allah? فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي First enter into my servants. Who are your servants? صَرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ Those that I have blessed. Don't have ill feelings towards my servants. My righteous people. Do not hate them. Do not dislike them. You may disagree with them, but they're my chosen people. Rather go in their company. Accept them. And what will I going to do to you? Udkhuli, jannati. I will then enter you in my paradise. Take their companionship so that you can improve yourself because they're also improving and they're in the improving state. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائل المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم والله سبحانه وتعالى we ask you to guide us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask you to guide us the way you want us to be guided Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this world a better place so that it is easier for us and not a big test for us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us better rulers who rule us with peace and harmony and tranquility Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to
keep us away from the fitna and the shar of this world and hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to please accept our good deeds. We know they are in a bad shape, but please accept us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please enter us in the Jannah without any question and answers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please move us in the Jannah, in the neighborhood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, make us among those people who would have the privilege of looking at you and you will look back at them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please guide us. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa habibana wa shafi'ana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.